Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the cervical segment. Um, this includes the cervical disc, the unconvertible joint, and the facet joints. Um, we'll be looking at their development and degeneration, and how they cooperate in segmental movement, and how we can use that as an assessment technique. So a quick review of the anatomy first. Looking across section here, um, we've got the end plate of the vertebra sitting there there. The uncus, which you really can't see terribly well here, is much more obvious in the diagram. So this develops in the first 10 years of life. It's not there at birth. And it reaches up to a facet on the other vertebra, on its partner vertebra. And then in the transverse canal, we have the vertebral artery, the accessory vertebral vein. Usually there's a vertebral nerve and the vertebral vein itself doesn't exist at this point it breaks into a plexus as it enters the transverse foramen and it surrounds the artery and runs down then reforms the vein when it leaves um, the transverse foramen of c6 typically uh, we can also see the spinal cord the nerve roots running through here the ganglion and then the spinal nerve here the cervical disc is different to the lumbar disc um, for a couple of reasons. This is actually showing a herniation of the disc if you're interested right here, compressing the cord and also here. But the disc in the cervical spine is different for a couple of reasons. One is the annulus is less well organized, so it doesn't have these nice concentric rings that you see in the um, lumbar disc. It's much more amorphous. Um, and the nucleus at birth is only about one third of the volume of the cervical disc compared to two thirds in the lumbar spine. So this already starts out small. And as we'll see with degeneration, this actually disappears um, with age. So this is the unsinner process, the anchors sitting up here. Um, post, it's on the posterior lateral aspect of the vertebra there. And it does give some protection to the um, to the artery in this area, which may be one reason why you don't see too many um, disc herniations um, in this region, because it really can't go posterolaterally. Unfortunately, what it does is directs it posteriorly. So there's the unsinner of process there. And this is the unconvertible joint sitting through there. And there's the foramen. And in a second, we'll look at how this degenerates. Um, but then we've got the facets there, the unsinner process sitting here. And this is showing how the unsinner process works inside flexion. So you're looking at this anteriorly, um, I think. So we've got the uncus here, and this is the joint. So the joint develops by loose collagen organizing itself on the outer side, forming the joint capsule on the inside the boundary is given by the disc itself and it fills up with interstitial fluid not by um, synovial fluid. Degeneration of the unsinner process of the young convertible joint involves osteophytosis so generally the joint hypertrophies and you can see the osteophyte sitting there whereas on this side you can see that they're not present you've got a nice wide frame and this is closing it down um, and there's a facet and what happens is of course you get a two for one here you get osteophytes forming from the facet joint you get osteophytes forming from the um, unconvertible joint and you end up with a really quite narrow frame so lateral stenosis is more common in the cervical spine than it is in the lumbar spine the other thing about these joints is that they are better developed superiorly than inferiorly and what you see is um, they're much more vertical in the upper neck and they become increasingly oblique and smaller as you move down the neck until they're completely gone by the lowest cervical segment now we're going to look at some degeneration here so we're going to look at um we're going to be looking at um the disc and the um, the disc degenerating primarily, and then we'll look at how movement occurs. So I'm going to go to whiteboard now. Here, and I'm going to do one of my wonderful drawings for you. So if we look down on the disc, we see this: the two facet joints sitting posteriorly, the unconvertible joint sitting laterally. Now the the facet joints are orientated in a position where they're quite capable of allowing free rotation. Um, but this is limited and modified by the unconvertible joints. We see the same arrangement actually in the thoracic spine, um, where the head of the rib projects up and acts as an unconvertible joint. Um, there, the costovertebral joints. So 
this is what we see. The nucleus, as I say, is actually quite small. So it's like so. And with age, and really quite young age, that disc will disappear. The nucleus will disappear. Um, so by the time you're 30, basically you have no nucleus in the cervical disc, except at the bottom level that does survive. Um, so the cervical disc could be better compared to a synthesis than, by, than to an intervertebral um, disc. If we look at the movements of this, um, what we'll see is this. If we look at flexion extension here, okay, we've got the disc sitting there, we've got the facet joint sitting like so, and the unconvertible joint is sort of sitting like that. So if we flex this thing, you get an anterior um, osteochematic rotation. There is some translation across the disc, which will be to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the status of the disc, but also on whether it's an active movement or a passive movement. If it's an active movement, the muscle activity will limit the translation more than the muscle tone will with passive movement. Um, now, because of the minimal amount of translations occurring there, we can model quite nicely the movement of the and the convertible joint as a spin um, that, and ignore the gliding component. There's a little bit of anterior gliding, but it, we can ignore it for the most part. And then at the facet joint, we see that superior joint moving upwards. Extensions, obviously the reverse um, with this coming this way, vertebral rocking that way, the translation being in that direction, the unconvertible joint rotating backwards, spinning backwards, and the facet moving downwards now. If we look at side flexion, what we have is this. Um, there's our vertebra now. And we've got the disc again, we've got the facet joint sitting out there, and we've got the unconvertible joint here. So if we look at the back of this, what we'll have is left side flexion. So left side flexion, the vertebra is going to rock in that direction. We're going to get this movement occurring there. That is extension of the left facet, flexion of the right facet. And now the U-joints actually do glide. So we've got an inferior glide on this left joint and a superior glide on the right joint. And the translation now is to the right. So this is what you don't see in the lumbar spine. With the lumbar spine, if I bend sideways, you'll see translation to that side here. If I bend sideways, you'll see translation to the opposite side. Um, and this is this is part of the function of the unconvertible joint. It's there to restrict and modify rotation um, and produce not an act, not allow an axial rotation around a vertical axis, but a combined rotation side flexion or side flexion rotation. Now we can utilize this in our assessment. And the way you're going to be taught this is using side bending and translation in flexion and extension. Now I'm going to simplify the whole thing and just draw the facet joints and the unconvertible joints. And again, we'll look at left side flexion. Again, you're looking at it from the back. So if I left side bend, this one will come down. This one will go up, that is flex. This one will move inferiorly. This one will move superiorly. And just to let you know, we're approximating these glides of the unconvertible joint to superior and inferior, although there is an obliquity to this, but the obliquity varies according to where you are in the neck. So we will approximate that language ways anyway, as inferior and superior glides. Now, if we look at side flexion to the left in flexion, what we see is this happening. There's our left side flexion. This left facet will extend, glide inferiorly. The U-joint will glide inferiorly, the right U-joint superiorly, and this facet will glide superiorly, that is flex. Now, as we said, that's for, that is for um, side flexion. If I want to look at this now, and we say we're doing this now for inflection, so we'll flex it first. What happens is this. This joint will glide up and that joint will glide up. Now I side flex. So this joint now will come back to a more neutral position. This will glide down, this will glide up, and this one will have to glide further up 
and stretches capsule. Now, if for any reason that joint can't achieve full flexion, um, whether it's because that joint is in trouble or the U joints are in trouble, or it's being held by muscle, it really doesn't matter. But if that joint can't fully flex, then what you can't do is left side flex in flexion and you'll get an abnormal wind fill on a limited amount of movement. Now let's look at this for extension. And what we see is this. There's our uh, facet joints, there's our unconvertible joints. We'll do left side flexion again, but this time extend it. So this one will glide down and this one will glide down with extension. Then we side flex it. This one will have to glide further down. This one will glide back to a more neutral position. This will glide down and that will glide down. So when we're actually testing these, we can utilize these asymmetrical movements. We can flex it, side bend, translate it, extend it, side bend, translate it, and we can find that we've lost movement or we've got full movement. The way we know which joint is in trouble is to glide that joint. Now, in this case, for example, we won't worry about gliding the right joint, for side flex and left in extension because you know that can't limit it. So we can glide the left joint or either of the two unconvertible joints. Now, if we look at this, two of these side by side, what we have is this. This will be flexion. This will be extension. And we'll do left side flexion again. So I flex, this goes up, that goes up. I side flex, this one comes back to neutral, this one glides down, that one glides up, and this one glides further, there. In extension, I extend, they both glide down. I side flex left, this one glides down further. This one glides down, this one glides up, and this one glides back to neutral. So what we can say is, in flexion, the joint in left side flexion and flexion, the joint that can't be restricted in the movement is that. Any of the other three could. In um, extension, the joint that can't resist the restricted movement is that one. Both times that joint simply has to return to a more neutral position and not go further into its range. So this is a good screening test. It's very quick, it's easy to do, it's easy to feel abnormalities. Um, and then we can apply the glides after that. So this is how you're going to be testing it, and this is what you're going to be seeing. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, and we'll discuss it when we see each other. All right, guys, take care, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.